So at the end, what we hope you'll do after this panel is commit with us to working together to battle climate change and really be inspired to pursue climate related or environmental careers and look at some of those different career pathways and internships that can lead to long term careers. So without further ado, I want to introduce our four women in climate that are part of the panel today. And the women you're gonna meet work at the Department of Energy, which I'm gonna to refer to as DOE from this point forward, and also two of the Department of Energy, DOE National Laboratories, Sandia National Labs and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So first of all, let's start off by introducing Walea Johns, Senior Advisor, Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs from the US Department of Energy. Second, Dr. Nicole Mendoza, senior researcher in the Wind Energy Systems Program at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Dr. Erica Raisler, who is a principal scientist in atmospheric sciences at Sandia National Laboratories. And Dr. Suchi Talati, chief of staff, Office of Fossil Energy at the US Department of Energy. So these are our four great panelists that are gonna answer some questions today. And then after we do our panel and some questions, you're also going to hear from Egrid Gregory, who is at the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, about their website and some resources to further get involved in climate action. So before we actually jump into the panel sessions, there was a great video that we wanted to share with all of you that really helps to set the stage. And so we're going to take a couple seconds here. There may be a little bit of a delay to pull up a YouTube video that Secretary Granholm shared with the nation recently. So we'll pause here and let this play. And we're still working on getting that spooled up, so please be patient and just stay with us. You're not missing the video yet for any of you that are dialed in. And I know we're not hearing any sound, but I think we can go ahead and actually watch um, the video and watch some of the uh, words that are showing. I think you can get the idea in terms of um, just the amount of investment and the cost of climate. And here is Secretary Granholm. Emergency and to create healthy, safe and thriving communities. We have the tools to put America on an irreversible path to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So what does it mean for you? It means cheap, abundant, clean power made right here in the US. Here at the Department of Energy, we have the world's most brilliant scientists and energy experts figuring out all the ways to make it happen. And deploying these solutions are gonna create millions of good paying jobs, all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people. And those jobs, will lift communities that have been left behind. Communities whose children can't inhale a full breath because they've been poisoned by pollution from the smokestacks of dirty factories. Or coal and oil and gas communities who are now seeing their jobs vanish because the world is demanding cleaner energy. We need a unified national response to climate change. We are committed to facing climate change by delivering environmental justice. We're gonna make sure that every worker and every community can benefit from and see their future in these clean energy solutions. I'm Jennifer Granholm. I am so proud to be the next secretary of the Department of Energy. Let's get to work. Wonderful. Thank you, Secretary Granholm. So I think that's an inspiration for all of us to think about how we can contribute to climate and actually um, seek careers that were alluded to. And so we're going to learn a little bit more about some of those opportunities. And so for the next part of our event, I'm going to ask our four panelists just a few questions about their climate action careers and give you an opportunity to get to know them just a little bit better. So let's start off and let's um, 
have some questions. And I think we're going to try and display the questions on the screen as we go through so that everyone that's watching can also uh, recall what we're asking of the panelists. But I'll go ahead and jump into the first question while we're getting the slide up on the screen. So first order of business, let's start off by learning a little bit about our panelists. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to actually tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path. So, well, Leah, why don't you start and tell us about your career path in climate? Um, thank you for having me on this panel, Marcy, and every all the uh, panelists. I started my uh, climate path really um, looking at my backyard. Uh, I come from a region in North um, Eastern Arizona, where um, Navajo Nation, it's a really beautiful region, and um, live near one of the big, biggest coal mining operations in the country, and um, learned about the whole industry and um, the economic benefits and the job creation, but also learned a lot about uh, water and learned about um, the process and then also started to learn more about climate change and um and and then also how um you know greenhouse gases have um you know been emitting uh from the united states at a, at a different rate than other countries and uh, wanted to take more action uh locally and then uh created a network of young people uh within our tribal nation and started to organize within our communities and then ended up, I think two years later, going to the conference of parties, um, the international climate change uh, uh, conferences that happened in the winter in, in uh, December and started being a part and learning more about international policies on climate and solutions. And, um, but also how we are so interconnected um, even as indigenous peoples uh, we all have see kind of the same impacts that are happening in our backyard in regards to climate and um, and, and also the the impacts are different in, in other areas. And so having a global perspective of how climate change is um, also um, being conscious of like, you know, who has resources, who doesn't, who's emitting more, who is, you know, than the other. And all of that, I think, helps shape my um, understanding of you know, why I wanted to be more involved in the solutions. So that's what brought me here. And I've been at Renewable Energy and I've been doing a lot of off-grid solar battery storage to create um, power for a household. Um, and also understanding the um, need for building community, community resiliency um, by clean energy and by working together um, in community. So that's been my path and I'm excited to be a part of the DOE team, learning a lot here. And I'm just really grateful for um, colleagues who have similar stories and vision for the future and really trying to bring a healthier um, place to our communities, but also take care of our planet for our future generations. Thanks, Valeria. That's really inspirational to hear about um, how your passion grew from a really young age and continues on into your career. I'm sure that will be motivating. And we'll come back to you later in the, the session and ask a little bit more about some of the things that you mentioned today, because we'd like to pull a string on a couple of things. So, but let's continue on and get to know the rest of the panel. And so, Nicole, maybe you could go next and tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path. Hi, everyone. And just wanted to say thank you very much uh, to the DOE for organizing this panel and also for everyone who's attending. Uh, really, really glad to see and talk to everyone here today. Um, so my story also started when I was fairly young. I was uh, in elementary school in the early 90s and going into the mid 90s. And that was when the Amazon rainforest was burning out of control and also during the age of the Kyoto Protocol and uh, some of those uh, and some of the major oil spills as well and just all of these environmental disasters. And so I've been a passionate environmentalist for as long as I can remember. And I've always uh, been trying to do my part if it's recycling in my house 
um, you know, turning off lights um, and other energy efficiency measures in the home. But then also, I wanted to dedicate my career to fighting climate change and helping protect and, and save the planet. And so uh, when I was in high school in my junior year, I decided that science and engineering uh, were what I was really good at and what I truly enjoyed doing. I loved creating and innovating new technologies and just really brainstorming really cool, neat solutions to solve today's problems, particularly around the climate and uh, sustainability. And so in college, I got my bachelor's and PhD in aerospace engineering. I uh, realized about halfway through my PhD that <laughs> uh, very blue type applications like, like rockets and uh, space and things like that weren't particularly environmentally friendly. And so I uh, got a job on uh, doing high speed activities and, and projects at Boeing. And I was with Boeing for about three and a half years. Um, but I, I eventually decided that my technical background and uh, very strong passions around saving the planet were best merged or um, coalesced or represented by wind energy. And so I, I began looking for a career in wind and Fortunately, I was able to get a job with Siemens Gamesa, one of the big four wind turbine manufacturers. And I was there doing wind turbine blade design for about three years. And then I uh, made the jump over to the National Renewable Energy Lab, which was more the direction that I wanted my career to go. And so I'm uh, quite happy here, innovating new technology solutions in wind energy and I'm very passionate about promoting women and minorities in STEM being Latina myself. And I, I just really am happy to be here and to share with all of you all of the different ways that uh, you can have meaningful and impactful careers in renewables, but especially in wind energy. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That was awesome. I, and I think we will give you an opportunity here in a few minutes to talk a little bit more about your career at a national lab and see what advice you might have for our attendees. So thank you for uh, sharing with us your path to where you are today. So we have another awesome researcher. Um, Erica, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much, Marcy um, and Department of Energy for this opportunity. Uh, again, I, my story starts at a young age. I liked, um, I still like a lot of different things, um, particularly reading, math, art, and writing uh, as early as elementary school. And uh, it was my third grade teacher, Mrs. Ann Johnson. Uh, she told me that I was good at it. And uh, it was that compliment at that very, you know, transitional age that carried me um, all, all the way through high school to doing and trying harder things. And uh, she was an amazing teacher, and I'll always remember that genuine compliments um, really go far when I'm working with kids, when I get to work with kids in outreach programs. And uh, I, I carried that to high school. Um, I continued to have a lot of different interests and uh, into high school. I like sports and theater and art, and I still like sciences. Um, it was my dad who uh, encouraged my siblings and me to go into engineering related fields because they were, they were, you know, good jobs to get uh, at the time and still, still are. And uh, I found scholarships where I could go to uh, Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff and uh, be a physics and astronomy major. I, I really liked, um, I really liked the night sky. I thought, you know, there's pretty cool things out there. Um, it was kind of funny though, in that process, I uh, found, you know, really, um, how humans can impact the environment around us through light pollution. And, uh, and then I also found out that I kind of liked thinking more about um, what was happening on the earth and its resources instead of maybe what was happening um, millions of light years away. So uh, I switched, I sort of fell down from the night sky to, to the earth and uh, 
now I get to work with uh, atmosphere um, and climate science researchers and be one myself. And I just uh, want to say that, you know, now in 2021, um, it's very exciting to be standing on this ledge of climate research and action, um, especially at a national lab where, where there's people um, of all different backgrounds uh, collectively working together on a federal and international level, as well as in their own backyards to produce good things for our planet and its future inhabitants for the next generation. And, uh, and I'm really inspired by that. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. It's great to hear that so many of your careers actually started um, with that passion that was sparked at a young age. And so I'm going to turn over to our final panel member, Suchi, and have you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path. Sure. Um, thank you, Marcy. And um, thank you all for being here. And I'm so excited to, to speak with all these wonderful women on this panel. Um, so I, I also um, loved math and science at a young age. I think that's definitely a theme here, just love of science and environment. And, um, you know, thought that science and engineering was the path that I wanted to take and, you know, majored in environmental engineering in undergrad, um, but had a really amazing opportunity to take an internship in Washington, D.C. at a young age and was inspired by policy and by the good that, you know, politics the right way could do. Um, and so pursued a master's degree in climate uh, and society and to learn, you know, what societal impacts can be on the climate crisis. Um, I was lucky enough to work at an NGO at a nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C. to advocate for climate policy changes. Uh, but in, in that time, I missed science and I missed the kind of the amazing work that an impact that research could have. And so really decided that I needed to sit at this nexus of science and policy and decided to pursue a PhD that could help me build that career. And so I did a dual PhD in engineering and public policy where I focused on climate mitigation policies and really got to understand you know, how policy impacts science and also how science impacts policy. Um, and really got to you know, understand the nuances and meaning of these, you know, seemingly small choices, but the impacts they have on so many people. And so decided that I wanted to continue kind of that nexus work and came back to DC um, and pursued a congressional science fellowship where I was able to advise um, in the United States Senate on climate and energy issues. And it was a fantastic opportunity um, afterwards. I moved back to the uh, nonprofit sector and was able to pursue uh, climate and engineering policy issues from that perspective and was able to advocate and work around creating legislation and advising Congress and, you know, while the Trump administration was in place on figuring out how we can ensure that climate actions can continue to make sure research can continue and to make sure science, you know, has the um, funding and advocacy that it needed. Um, and, you know, and on January 20th, I was lucky enough to come back to the administration. And now I'm working in the Office of Fossil Energy. Um, it's a name that can be a little misleading, but my goal for this office is very much to make it centered on climate change, around equity, and ensuring that we are, you know, ensuring that our committed infrastructure and you know the fossil fuels that we are currently using today are done are used in a safe and just manner and that we have a path towards decarbonization um, that is also equitable and so um, I will stop there. Great thanks Suchi. So I think one of the themes we just heard and I saw a comment in the chat right that uh, Many of you, all of you had a love for science and engineering and actually made that your course of study and you may have augmented that with other knowledge along the way. And so I think we'll hear a little bit more about some of the uh, ways that you all work through your careers. We dive into a couple more questions a little bit deeper. And so I wanna start off and transition away from our introductions and maybe pull the string a little bit on something that Secretary Granholm showed in the video, and that was about DOE's commitment to prioritizing energy justice and equity in climate action. And so those of you that are listening may have heard about DOE's new Energy Justice Office and President Biden's Justice 40 initiative. 
which is a plan to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of climate investments to disadvantaged communities and inform equitable research, development, and deployment. So I thought we should learn a little bit more about that today. So Walea, I think I'm gonna to turn to you and ask, in the context of careers, how do we make sure that we're bringing people into climate careers in an equitable way? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I, I do think just um, understanding the um, disproportionate impacts of climate change is um, really what for me it shaped my understanding what even what climate justice means, um, that there are communities that are affected and impacted more than others. Um, in I actually um, traveled a lot, you know, 15 years ago and visit communities where um, they have been seeing climate change for, you know, over nearly 30 years. Um, and that they didn't have the kind of means to protect their, their homes with like, um, with air conditioning or when there's extreme heats um, that that happens or um, some communities also um, island communities that lose their homes and their communities to flooding um, uh, or in the Arctic region where you know you have you know villages that are also you know um, uh, starting to needing to relocate because of climate change and I think that when you come with that lens you understand that this is affecting people disproportionately in our in the world and um, many times these communities are the least responsible for cl the climate changing and um, the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. And um, I think this is when I started to learn a lot more about how policy is created and who's at the table and who's not at the table. And, and understanding this is really important because um, I feel like in order for us to um, really bring that awareness is that we also need to be inclusive and bring people who are from the community that are being affected and having their voices heard in shaping policy and in shaping what time to, what's going to be helpful for their communities. And I come from the community because I um, had to really understand the um, indigenous peoples have knowledge that is an ancient wisdom that still exists today in the caretaking of Mother Earth and their land their homeland um, and 80% of the biodiversity in the world is on or near indigenous people's land. And that's incredible. So why not, why aren't we doing as much as we can to support indigenous peoples in their land and their life ways to take care, take care of their, their home? Because they are, you know, like if you go to the Amazon, they say that's the lungs of mother earth. Um, and so, so much of this is, has to be interconnected. And when we think about science, we also got to consider traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples and what they bring because they are closest to um, this knowledge and the caretaking of our planet. And I think that's, for me, uh, that's how I was taught um, is, is this traditional knowledge that we carry and uplifting that as, as a way to um, guide us. And I feel like with that knowledge and that insight will be helpful in these solutions that we craft and create uh, room and space for um, communities and, and women that come from different communities, a diversity, um, whether you're Native American, you know, or Indian Asian, um, you know, it, I think it's just, it's, um, there's just more need for um, that uh, perspective because we, can get to the solution much faster collectively. Um, and so I do feel like uh, there, there are a lot of good um, uh, with this administration commitment to equity and environmental justice, climate justice. And I'm really excited about um, opening more pathways for um, students and you all to be a part of that solution. And, um, and making sure we're bridging and creating a pipeline that is prioritizing um, you know, tribal colleges and universities or minority institute serving institutions. And you know, I think that's, that's a great way to start to bring in uh, the next generation 
of leaders. And, and I think I have uh, a 10 and 13 year old and it's amazing how much when I hear their perspectives on climate and how we need to be responding, it's, it's amazing. And I think that the more that we, you know, create STEM opportunities at a young age, the, the better we're going to be and our planet's going to be on these solutions. So thank you so much. Thanks, Walea. That was um, certainly a great um, description. And I know that we have a lot of participants that come from some of the institutions that you mentioned. And so we hope that this too will help them pursue climate careers. And you certainly serve as a, a role model for everyone that's looking uh, to move into climate. So thank you for sharing that. And so sort of on that note, let's continue talking about careers and climate. And we heard from Nicole and Erica at the beginning about how they got to their research positions that they now hold at National Labs. But I'm going to turn back to them and just see if there's anything else that they would like to share about their experiences and maybe in particular why they chose to work at a national lab or even any advice for someone just graduating from college or going into college. So Nicole, let's start with you. What would you like to share with the group today? Hey, thank you so much. Um, you know, the, the world has a, a great many problems, um, but I could argue that climate change affects everyone in this world, either directly or indirectly. And in my personal opinion, cl fighting climate change is the single biggest challenge that we are undertaking in this generation and moving forward in the future generations and learning to live sustainably and in harmony with our planet while maintaining the standard of living or improving uh, the standard of living for, for those around the world. And so, you know, with, with that perspective in mind, I, I truly feel that a career in renewables and, or in any, I, I mean, truly any effort that one makes to fight climate change is going to be a truly rewarding and meaningful an impactful career um, that you know will really inspire you and, and help you feel like you're making a positive difference in the world. So, um, because of my uh, aerospace engineering degrees, I found my niche in aerospace engineering and in wind energy, in particular, um, as an aerodynamicist. I'm constantly finding new ways to apply my technical skills to other problems in carbon capture, in airborne and distributed wind, um, and, and beyond. So um, I wanted to say a handful of things related to uh, the different career options that are available. Um, first and foremost, you know, to fight this global problem, we need everyone's help. We need everyone to work together and to collaborate to to help solve these so many issues uh, that that we have and it it really does take everyone you know a, a lot of people feel that yeah what am i as one person going to do to fight climate change but you know what impact am i going to have you know it's kind of this big scary problem but when we all work together and we all do our little part to help, I mean, all of those changes, all of those uh, impacts add up over society, over our countries. And so there are um, three different areas where you can uh, choose to make a, a better impact. And one of them is in your homes, um, everything from recycling to energy and material efficiency um, to composting and gardening. Uh, green roofs. I mean, the Department of Energy's website has a, a ton of suggestions there, but uh, having good environmentally friendly habits in your home that, that are cheap and easy to do can really add up. Um, a second way that you can do it is with your businesses. Um, are, are, are your businesses uh, have LED lighting? Um, are you using clean electricity? You know, d does your company have uh, renewable energy targets or standards? Uh, is your HVAC system efficient? You know, are you using natural locally sourced materials? You know, all kinds of ways uh, to improve or make an 
environmentally friendly, your built environment, your transportation, you know, do you, do you use public transportation? Do you use sustainable way, um, walking, biking, et cetera? Do you have an environmentally friendly vehicle like a plug-in hybrid or an electric car, you know, things like that. But then finally, the third way to really make an impact on the climate is with your career. And like I said before, climate change needs everyone, everyone from leasing contracting agents to lawyers, to marketing and salespeople, to communications, to community relations folk, to go out and um, talk with the community and get community feedback in the planning and the project development processes. I mean, whatever your skill set is, climate change can use you or, and, and, and you can have a truly meaningful and impactful career um, and make a positive difference in the world by having a career in climate change. And I mean, it, it runs the gamut from, from legal folk to, to intellectual property folk, to, to business executives, to journalists. I mean, everyone um, can contribute to this. So in, in terms of um, my personal experiences about why I chose to work at a national lab, um, I, I wanted to uh, work for the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, when I graduated from college, mostly because its mission and vision perfectly aligned with my own. Like I said, I'm a very passionate environmentalist and I wanna help innovate technology solutions towards a greener, cleaner future. And that's pretty much what NREL's mission is uh, reworded probably better. So, um, you know, I just felt this personal connection. And now that I'm here at the lab, you know, it's just filled with really smart, like-minded people who are also all passionate about the work that we do and, um, you know, save, saving the planet to, to the degree that, that we do. And um, so, so that's why I want to work at NRO. For uh, the for the younger folks on the call, um, you know, there, there are just so many options and getting um, some, some information, getting introduced, if it's, if it's a tour, if it's uh, a webinar, if it's a YouTube video, if it's something like this panel, you know, getting an introduction into these fields uh, like renewable, uh, I'm sorry, like wind, solar, geothermal, bioenergy and biofuels, HVAC, I mean, carbon capture, just the list goes on and on. Material science research. Um, it, it's just truly remarkable. Um, and so if, if you're thinking about uh, college or not, there are some career opportunities for you. So if you don't wanna do college, the wind energy technician program uh, is, uh, doesn't require a college degree, and it's arguably one of the fastest growing uh, uh, jobs on, on the market today. And what that is, is you get to go up into a turbine and fix stuff. So it's very hands-on and very exciting uh, to get up in a hard hat on a real machine. So then from there, you have different uh, collegiate opportunities and, and degrees that you can get that will support uh, a career in wind energy. As far as uh, whether or not to go into grad school, I feel like that's a very personal decision. I strongly recommend uh, looking at the careers or the jobs of people that you know that inspire you and look at, look at job descriptions and see what the requirements are to see what, what you need to do to get a job in that field. So, all right. I hope, that's I hope I've covered the gamut, um, but that's all I have. That's great advice. Thanks, Nicole. I really appreciate how you shared the whole spectrum of careers that are available and gave people some ideas on options they could pursue. So without uh, further ado, Erica, I'm going to ask you the same question in terms of um, any advice or why you chose to work at a national lab. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Marcy. Um, so Marcy and I do work at the same national lab, so we're both hailing from, from Albuquerque. And uh, I'd like to state that um, I have four young children. So um, working at a national lab or an institution that provides a work-life balance um, has been, is important, is extremely important. And um, I, uh, especially in these pandemic times. So I think that's probably one of the, you know, the biggest reasons 
I just wanted to put that out there besides, you know, the climate um, opportunities is that it's a, it's a very um, inclusive and um, supportive place to work for, for working moms. Um, I do, I like working at the national lab um, because of the, the science collaborations and engineering that can be done there. Um, for instance, in the National Lab so far, I've had projects where I've worked on the state-of-the-art climate models running on the fastest supercomputers on the planet and uh, producing, you know, what maybe what the Earth would look like in the next hundred years um, with incredible accuracy and detail, more so than a human could even process. So I find that just very um, humbling that, uh, you know, really standing on the shoulders of giants to be able to work with these sorts of things. I can also have access to remote field sites and do data collection experiments. Um, for instance, I've been able to go up to the north slope of Alaska and see Barrow and Prudhoe Bay and see firsthand what the weather is like up there and how difficult it is to collect data and also how difficult it is to live there and maybe um, what some of the firsthand challenges day to day would be. Um, uh, if I wanted to to think about that further. Um, I really like thinking um, about uh, big problems and the National Lab is a great place to do that. Uh, we have big thinkers in renewable energy and grid technology, systems, problems, and even fusion sciences. So even, even nuclear sciences. So again, this is an all in type problem. There's, you know, we've learned, I think um, that there's not going to be one uh, golden ticket, golden egg for, you know, fixing the climate and our biodiversity challenges and our ecosystem challenges. So thinking about this from a systems point of view, um, with as many different perspectives and, uh, and their knowledge, their firsthand knowledge of their environment and their needs is going to help us all, I think, in the long run. Um, we have that, we can get that input, we can help get that input and that data, you know, working on a multi-institution collaborative team that's supported at the National Lab. Um, and other projects I've been able to work with writers and actors and artists and lawyers. So again, um, you know, if uh, if science isn't your cup of tea um, and you like TikTok, um, you can make a climate action video and uh, it can really, you know, go places. So there's, a, there's always opportunities, you know, at all points of your life to to you know, pursue your passion. Um, you know, here being on this call, I hope this um, you know inspires you to think of ways that you can uh, um, take your passion forward outside of the box. You know, not needing a giant supercomputer or climate model. Um, I, I do want to say that it is uh, we are called on at Sandia to be um, in service to our nation, and that's a call that I'm very proud to be a part of. Um, it's always challenging and never boring and boring and very rewarding to, to work at a national lab. And uh, and I, I do want to mention again that uh, that you know this climate action problem is in my my point of view is a is a systems problem. Um, of course, there's you know a lot of low hanging fruit that we can. Um, that we can do as a nation, um, as, a, as individuals um, that can help. Um, with my own kids, for instance, um, in the systems point of view, we're talking about what type of tree we want to plant in our front yard um, because it's kind of hot in Albuquerque. And we want a tree that will shade the house so that we will have to, we don't have to use the air conditioning as much. But we also want a tree that um, you know, is good for the environment, will take not a lot of water because we live in a desert. And then hopefully we'll uh, we'll take in some carbon in its lifetime too. So um, these are all questions that I don't have the answer for. But um, working at a place where data can be collected and databases can be generated and websites can be filled, I'm hoping that you know my next step in research is to answer these questions for other people who live in other communities. Simple things like what type of tree would be best to plant in my front yard. So thank you. Thanks, Erica. That was great. So I know we're coming to sort of the end of our questions for the panel because we do have, as I mentioned before, Egrid that's going to share some really interesting opportunity information with us. But there is one question that I wanna make sure we spend a couple minutes on. And Suchi, I'm gonna send this question your way. It's clear that all of our panelist members are really passionate about climate change, but I'm wondering in just a couple of minutes, could you tell us from your perspective, given your position within DOE, why is climate change such a hotly debated topic? 
It, it's a really good question. And, and honestly, in my opinion, it, it's because of political choices, right? Climate change is inherently a global problem where everyone has a stake and everyone has a responsibility. Um, and so the fact that it's become such a politically you know, debated hot topic is because of how it's been framed and how um, you know, leaders have decided to talk about it. And I think, you know, we've seen that changing, um, but we've also seen slips back and forth over the, over the last few decades. You know, we've been warned of this problem since the 80s, if not before. We've had a long time to figure out how to respond. And I think the fact that we were still having the debate about whether this problem was real until very recently um, is deeply divisive and problematic. Um, let us absolutely debate the approaches and solutions and how we want to figure out how we want to you know, address this problem. And there is no one answer to that question. And so let's have that discussion, but it took us too long to have that discussion. Um, and I think, you know, working in the field of, you know, fossil fuels and carbon management, I think that's where a lot of, a lot of the kind of this debate and, um, you know, problematic discussion has stemmed from and, you know, figuring out how we create accountability while also making sure that communities centered around coal or fossil fuels are not left behind is such a hard problem. And I think people are scared and people are concerned that they're not going to have jobs or they're not going to have a way of life that's been there for generations. And I completely sympathize and empathize, but there, but let's figure out how to make sure that those communities are taken care of and those communities have good paying union jobs um, available to them. Let's make sure that communities that have been affected by pollution um, are able to have energy security from clean energy, are able to raise their families in a way where they're not impacted negatively by fossil fuels. I think it's such a challenging problem because there's no one answer. And you know, when it comes to fossil fuels, it's it's figuring out how we deal with the infrastructure that's committed. You know, we we know that we're not going to switch to clean electricity immediately. It's going to take time. We have infrastructure that produces electricity. We have workers that work in this field and it's it's going to be a transition. So make, let's make it a just one and let's just bring everyone along um, to make sure that, you know, we all have a safe environment to live in. Great. Thanks, Suchi. That's really, uh, you know, a refreshing perspective. And I think uh, we right at the National Labs and the Department of Energy are really looking for those solutions that are right on. So we hope people that are listening today will join us in that. And so, I would like to close out our panel session with just a little bit of a lightning round for each one of you. And so I'm going to ask you all to maybe share about one sentence with us. And it's really going to be around what gives you hope. So as you all continue the amazing work that you do at the Department of Energy and the National Labs, what positive things do you see on the horizon or what, what gives you hope? So let's do a lightning round through our panel. Walea, you're up first. Oh, wow. Good question. Um, I think my my uh, my children give me a lot of hope, for sure. Thank you. Yes, they are inspiring. We heard that from several of you today. Nicole, about you, what gives you hope? Uh, just the sheer number of young people that care about uh, climate and the environment. There's a lot of really great youth-led, youth-driven organizations that are working on conservation and activism. And it's just absolutely wonderful and inspiring to see how much the next generation cares. And yeah, especially across the diversity spectrum. Agreed, thanks, Nicole. Erica, what gives you hope? Um, what gives me hope is probably seeing uh, all of the incredible opportunities that are out there today with um, carbon, di carbon dioxide removal um, issues and problems, just creative thinking and uh, diversity in uh, backgrounds from, from all walks of life. And again, um, you know, this is an all in problem and I'm really inspired by how people are really all in. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And Suchi, what gives you hope? Um, I would say the people that I 
get to work with and have gotten to work with. I think every time I'm just so astounded by how committed people are to this work and how how passionate they are. And, you know, at DOE especially, you know, I've, I've only been here a couple of months, but I'm, I've just been astounded and so excited for everyone that I've gotten to work with. Agreed. I think all of you on the panel today represent the great people that we have working on this problem. And so I hope others uh, have come to appreciate that over the last half hour or so since you've been sharing with us some thoughts. So with that, I want to thank you, the panelists, and I'm going to move over and introduce Egrid Gregory. And Egrid is the group manager at an institute that's called the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education and is going to share with you some ways to get involved and to look for some opportunities. So Egrid, I believe you're gonna share your screen with us and give us a little bit of a demo. Why don't you go ahead and take over? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you and see you just fine. Perfect. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, oh, can uh, you share my screen or uh, put the slides on? Um, by now, uh, you're probably, uh, if you're a student or getting ready to graduate, you're probably thinking, okay, how do I get started? And we have a solution and an answer for you. ORISE uh, works with uh, different federal agencies up to, from the Department of Energy to 24 more uh, federal agencies to provide educational opportunities, such as internships, scholarships, and fellowships um, to help you put together what you're learning in school with hands-on experience and prepare you for the next step on your uh, professional development. So I'm going to share with you what we have here at ORISE and where do you start? And you start with Syntelec. You start by creating a profile. And uh, if you can see my screen, this is my ideal uh, participant, which is me. Uh, and I have applied to many, many opportunities here at ORISE. Uh, because the more opportunities I apply to, the more the chances I'm going to have to get an uh, internship, the internship of my dreams. Also, I don't want to limit myself to one opportunity uh, during my you know, undergraduate degree. I want to go everywhere. I want to go to the national labs. I want to go to the headquarters. I want to go to academia and explore all the opportunities that are available to me. So with that in mind, I'm going to create a profile here in Syntelect and just general information about myself, but more importantly, I'm going to add my resume. So I can start pairing opportunities in Syntelect with my resume. Um, there's different ways to look for opportunities. As, as, as I mentioned, there's many opportunities to consider. Not all of them will be of interest to you or you might not be eligible to all the opportunities, but they're there. Right now we have 658 and I promise next week we're going to have more opportunities because I'm about to add two more uh, next week. Uh, so I would love for you to come here often. Um, one of the ways that you can look for opportunities is, as I mentioned, to enter your resume in your profile. And then we have this uh, artificial intelligence tool that will look at your resume, the content of your resume, and will pair it with the opportunities uh, based on topic, based on qualifications. Um, and it will give you a suggested match, you know, between 80 and 100. But, you know, this might not be what you want. You know, uh, you might want to then Let's, let's uh, look at how we searches by um, match. And it will, it will throw you know, the, the top matches for you based on your resume. Uh, you can add that to keyword searches. What about if I say climate? I want something in that area since we have been talking about that. It moves them down to seven. You know, so you can use academic labor on the graduate or graduate students, or you're ready to graduate and looking for a postdoctoral, then into postdoctoral. So there's different ways that you can search for opportunity, but the key here is you have to come here often. But if you forget, we have another tool to help you remember us, and that is the ORISCO uh, mobile app. Download it 
you know, into your phone or um, mobile device. And you can set it up to remind you of events. You can set it up uh, to, you know, say, hey, anytime there's, there's a new undergraduate opportunity, send me a notification. The beauty of this is that when you become a participant, it also helps you manage your participant activities, you know, when deadlines are due, you know, documents are due and all that with just one, you know, sign in, you know, it, everything is controlled together. Um, so the, the other opportunities that we offer are not limited to what Sintelect offers. We just want to prepare you from beginning to end. And beginning means that you have a resume that, and an application that it is competitive, that it is a winning application. So we provide those resources for you. We also help you find internships based on your interest. But more importantly, and this is one of the things that I like to do the most, is uh, our participant stories is, can you do this? Yeah, if these, all these people can do it, you certainly can do it. You know, you can see yourself, you know, as a participant in one of our programs. Um, so this is a good way for you to be part, feel part and encourage you to apply. And hopefully someday we will write a story about you too. Uh, how you find us, you find us in different ways, you know, use social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, we're everywhere. And we use Facebook and uh, our social media tools very uh, often to provide not only information, but also uh, tips on how to interview. Uh, especially these days where all the appointments are virtual because of the restrictions with COVID, we're supporting virtual appointments, but also that means that your interview is going to be virtual. So this is what that, this video is showing, you know, just a quick way to help you get prepared for those virtual interviews. And as I said, we have a full team here ready to help you. If uh, you need advice or somebody to review your resume, we would love to help you with that. Uh, if you want us to point out several programs that are more eligible or suitable for you, let us know, we we'll help you with that. And what we're looking for is to help you be part of, you know, the um, mission culture of all the, depart the Department of Energy, but also the other agencies that we represent. So I hope this quick introduction to Syntelect and ORISE helped you. Please keep in mind that Syntelect ORISE is one of the tools that DOE offers to help you develop your career path, but it's not the only one. National labs have also great opportunities and you can go directly to the national labs uh, to look at uh, opportunities directly in each individual lab. Thanks, Eager. that was awesome. So great ideas, great resources. Um, we also have some other resources that are posted in the chat box that you can look at. And I know we've got lots of questions that were posted and we had some that were submitted ahead of time. However, unfortunately, we're close to the end of our session today. And so I think I'm going to wrap us up here and hope that you can leverage some of the opportunities such as with ORISE or the links that are in the chat. But First and foremost, I want to thank all of you for attending our virtual event today, and I hope you've caught a glimpse of what it might be like to battle climate change as a future career, and I hope that you, like the panelists, will stand up and uh, answer the president's call to action. So please take the opportunity to get involved. Consider some of the opportunities you heard about today. There are some other opportunities that are available. Uh, you've seen a couple slides that have been up on the screen about resources and we also have some open positions I know in our office of energy efficiency and renewable energy but a great way to stay connected is on the stem rising slide so you actually see this front and center right now where there's monthly updates that are available through newsletters and it's a great place to read about careers and people I know there's stories about Eric and Nicole and others that are out there on this website and just a reminder again that a link to the session will be available at actually the address that you see here on the screen or the one that was put in the chat box that simply said energy.gov slash stem and gets you to the same place. So you can catch it there. 
So in the end, I want to close by thanking all the panelists and, of course, thanking the Department of Energy for hosting this event and especially thanking all of you that joined us in the audience and repeating what Secretary Granholm stated, right? Addressing the climate crisis is going to rely on the power of science and innovation at a scale that the world's never seen before. And it's going to take a lot of great minds working together to address this crisis. But I'm confident with people like you, we will tackle climate change together. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we look forward to engaging with you in the future. And please reach out if you have any questions. Have a nice evening.